this is imports as a percent of GDP in China. It's gone from zero to 40 percent. China's going to be an import. So as free trade spreads around the world, here's the risk. China in the last two years has signed over 10 free trade agreements. In South America, Africa, elsewhere in Asia. We've signed zero. We haven't passed the Korea free trade agreement. We haven't passed the Colombia free trade agreement. We're going to be left behind. I mentioned access to capital, and you have to touch on that very briefly. Over the course of the last 10 years, and this is the regulation app that goes with the spending, there have been a series of rules all that seemed like a good idea at the time. It's a little obscure, but basically decimalization of the NASDAQ that got rid of profits for people who made market in small cap companies. Elliot Spitzer's global research settlement, which destroyed the small cap equity research business. Sarbanes-Oxley, which made it much more expensive for a little company to come public in America. People should be aware that here's the situation. They have yielded far less research, far less trading, far less liquidity, far less number of IPOs, and therefore far less innovation in the United States. And here's some data on that, because we've got to talk about how we have it. We have 500 IPOs a year, 150 in tech for, for decades. In the last decade, we've got average 100 IPOs a year, 20 in tech. Venture capitalists, when they get out of businesses now, they sell them to a larger company. Point being, last year, this is a chart I just picked up the other day. Last year, global share of IPOs, North America, that's NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, Toronto Stock Exchange, was 16%. In the 80s and 90s, it was 80% share of IPOs. So are we going to be the home of innovation? Now, I've given a totally depressing talk today, so I want to be, I want to close with something upbeat. There is hope. There is hope. This is totally possible. Why is this possible? Well, first, we went into this first. The economy is growing. We are not sinking. It is, we cannot, you know, fail to curb spending because, oh, we'll shrink the economy. The, the, the economy is now in its, you know, seventh quarter of growth out of the recession. But the scary part is that the growth is slow. But it is growth. The stock market is not in crisis. Companies can raise money. The stock market is a double since the bottom. If anybody here was smart enough to buy in March of 09, like Mr. Brooks and Mr. Newton were, they doubled their money. Um, most importantly, we went into the crash. We are coming out of a period where we, we, we yielded the fruits of having made good decisions. And the US economy came into this period extremely, extremely strong. You look at the 25 years, from 1982 to 2007, they were a golden era for the US and the world economy. In the United States, real income, which had been flat in the 70s, when we had a regime of high inflation and high interest rates, their real income was flat. It went up. In the next quarter century, it went up for all five quintiles of the population issues. The capital markets, Remember, they, everybody said, oh, they freaked out because we lost some wealth in the 2008 crash. We lost trillions of dollars of wealth. But the reality is, the capital markets had gone up by 12x uh, in the prior 20 years. <coughs> Americans started this in pretty healthy condition. People say, that was all fueled by debt. Here's the reality. The household net worth in the United States, all assets minus all liabilities, went from 14 trillion to over 60 trillion in, those tw in 20 years. Then it came way off, came off by 16 trillion, now it's at 55. So Americans right now are still 4X wealthier, 4X than a generation ago. So the, the US economy is resilient in the short term. We just need to make good decisions for the long term. By the way, we have a new thing that we never had in any prior era. The world is much stronger than it's ever been. And the United States is one of the world's leading exporters. In the last period of growth, whereas you used to have a third of the world's economy shrinking and two thirds growing, by 2007, only 2% 2 of the economies in the world were shrinking, or 3% of the economies in the world were shrinking. And, and the result of that, whoa, the result of that was a dramatic reduction in poverty around the world. And one of the things that, that if you look at how the economies grow, we're going to grow going forward, it's the strength of the global economy. How can we export to that global economy? Lastly, and this is good for both Wyoming and for the rest of the world. 
the deployment of technology that makes it people to have all kinds of new economic models and arrangements in remote places like Wyoming. This is an amazing statistic I got from the woman at Mastery Warrior, who was the CTO of Cisco and, and systems previously at Motorola. It took 20 years to sign up the first billion cell phone users in the world. It took three years to sign up the second billion. It took 18 months to sign up the third billion. It took nine months to sign up the fourth billion. There are now about four and a half billion, four and a half billion, about 80% of the world's population who have cell phones. It has connected them to the world economy. As has all of these other technologies that make our lives more efficient. So, it is possible to solve these problems if we make a few good decisions. So, two minutes on what we can do about it. Well, there are a few plans on the table. I mentioned Alan Simpson's coming here in a few weeks. He's got a report called The Moment of Truth. It would cut four trillion of debt off that, off that corpus of debt. There's no magic to it. He goes after a whole bunch of things at once. He would raise the retirement age. Once in 2050, once in 2075. Raise it by two years over the next 50 years. He says, if we can't do that, we can't do anything. Life expectancy is increased dramatically. He cap the growth of Medicare at GDP growth plus 1%. He started with a proposal that I liked which is to get rid of all the deductions and all the crazy things in the tax code and say there's three rates. If you make less than $70,000 a year, you pay 8%. If you make 70 to 210, you pay 14%. If you pay, make over 210, you pay 23%. Then people started complaining about his report. They came out with the chairman's mark. Then their final report, they added back in the earned income tax credit. They added back in the mortgage deduction up to $500,000. They added back in charitable contributions above a certain amount. Um, so on and so forth. It's pretty simple. For every deduction you add back in, you've got to raise rates. But at least it's a serious effort. Here's what was interesting. He, it was a bipartisan commission, and they got 11 of the 18 votes. I was amazed. I was one political side. I was amazed. If I were President Obama, I would have stood up in the State of the Union and said, I appointed this commission. It was bipartisan. It would have cut $4 trillion off the debt. And the rules were, if, it, if you got 14 votes, Congress had to vote up or down on it, no changes. He didn't get the 14, he got 11. If I were Obama, I would have stood up and said, I don't care, I still got a majority, I demand an up or down vote on this package, no changes, I want every Democrat to vote for. Three things would have happened. 75 Democrats on his left would have peeled off and made him look like a centrist. Two, he would have had a majority of votes. Three, he'd be very tough to beat. He'd probably guarantee his re-election if he was willing to cut four trillion off the debt. But he wasn't willing to propose it. I do think that's a lack of presidential leadership. My only policy comment, partisan comment on that. Um, there's another plan. Paul Ryan. He's got a slightly different mix. Okay. His, his proposal relies a lot more on spending cuts. He would cut, he said, $6 trillion over 10 years. He would take Medicaid and turn it over to the states in a block grant so they can design the program instead of having all these constricting rules. The thing that's gotten all the headlines is he says for Medicare, Instead of you going to the doctor and getting paid back whatever the reimbursement rate for that procedure is, um, we'll give you a certain amount that's your account, you buy health insurance with it, and you're covered. And that's obviously been quite controversial. Here's what Ryan says his plan would do, though. One of the things about this spike the last couple of years in spending, we, we had a period for really the last 30 years, really the post-war period, Spending as a percent of GDP is average about 21%. Taxes as a percent of GDP have averaged about 19%. Um, we spiked up to 25% of GDP here. Mr. Ryan would take us back below 20 in terms of spending as a percent of GDP. 